So the commissioner should be um, joining us very shortly. He has prepared an awesome presentation. So I'm super excited about that. As we wait, schedule for today, we're gonna finish um, talking about social consumption. So we're gonna go over that, finish the rest of the operational requirements, and then hopefully I can get into some um, of the co-located stuff, which should be fairly easy because after medical and adult use, you basically know what in a, what a, um, a co-located is going to require. So welcome, thank you so much for joining us. So last year, I was unable to invite you because the class time coincided with uh, the uh, CCC meetings. Ah. Um, conveniently. <laughs> yeah, we, sch we scheduled that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I'm going to um, briefly introduce you and then let you take it over. So okay. Chairman Hoffman has extensive background in business. Oh, unless you wanted to introduce yourself. Sometimes I want to do that. It's up to you. It's your, your class, your rules. Okay. I get to be Beyonce. Great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, he has extensive background in business and finance, and he served as a senior executive uh, in the management and consulting uh, in technology industries. In consulting, he was a partner at Bain & Company, where he led the firm's 600-person Boston office. And as senior vice president at CSC Index, he ran that firm's Chicago office and was the world leader of its strategy practice. So I, I don't think I don't know if you guys remember when I was talking about the um, qualifications for the chairman's position. Reading these, the, his background, you can kind of see why he was chosen. Uh, um, part of why. Okay, when he talks, you'll see more. Okay, so in the tech industry, Mr. Hoffman was an executive vice president and chief strategy officer at Sapient. And most recently, he's been the CEO of two venture capital backed startups, Thinkfire, which is an intellectual property transaction firm, and Exchange Solutions, a technology-enabled marketing services company. In both cases, he replaced the founder and led successful turnarounds, okay? Mr. Hoffman, he's a frequent speaker on corporate strategy and technology, he holds a BA in economics from Wesleyan University and an MBA in finance and statistics from the University of Chicago. And shout out to the University of Chicago for the work that they've done in a, um, a antitrust law. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. So um, the floor is yours, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lucian. Um, I always get a little bit uh, um, embarrassed and humbled when I hear somebody talk about my background the way you just mm -hmm. did. And uh, do you think it's a very impressive background or it's just that I haven't been able to hold on to a job for very long? <laughs> In any case, um, I, uh, I welcome the opportunity to come back, back here um, and, and speak with this group. Um, I think from my resume, it's obvious that I'm not a lawyer. So I'm happy to answer uh, all of the uh, questions you might have, but uh, if you're asking for a legal opinion, you're probably uh, barking up the wrong tree. Uh, what I thought I'd do, uh, uh, Professor Lucien gave me uh, a set of questions and topics she wanted me to cover. Um, and what I thought I'd do is use this timeline to both tell the story about how we've gotten to where we are, but also use that as a way to set up the conversation and uh, the topics that, that Professor Lucien asked me to cover. I will leave time at the end for a Q&A, but uh, please uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand or uh, text uh, uh, Professor Lucien, and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions as I go along the way. So let's uh, let's get started because it's a, it is a long story. Um, it goes back way before 2008, but uh, you know, from the perspective of uh, of my focus on this, uh, let's start with 2008 when marijuana was decriminalized in Massachusetts. Uh, uh, all it did was essentially say that possession of a small amount of marijuana was no longer a felony, that it was essentially uh, punished by a uh, small fine with no reporting uh, to the authorities, no criminal record. And that, that was 2008. Um, and it took four years uh, subsequent to that for the uh, voters in Massachusetts to approve medical marijuana. Um, that was a voter initiative in November of 2012. Uh, it was uh, voted in favor 63 to 37%. And I mentioned that because when you look down at the voter initiative to approve um, adult use marijuana, it was much closer. Um, the latter was much closer and much more contentious. It took uh, five years uh, or uh, four and a half years uh, for the uh, three and a half years for the uh, first medical marijuana 
uh, treatment center open after the law was passed. Um, and uh, that's when uh, my kind of involvement with this started. Um, I was a private citizen, as you saw from my resume, I was in the private sector. Um, in November 2016, I voted on question four, which legalized the adult use of uh, marijuana. Uh, for recreational purposes. Um, as the entire universe knows, much to my amazement, because um, it was announced at my first press conference, I voted against this um, initiative question four. And I voted against it not because I disagree with the objectives, I actually strongly support the objectives, but I actually thought that what uh, was mandated in the uh, voter initiative was way too aggressive in terms of timeline um, in a very complicated and controversial manner. And uh, I just thought it just needed to be done in, in, in a more gradual um, uh, phased approach. And it's, I guess, some, nothing short of ironic that I find myself now in a position of actually implementing something that I believe was uh, way too aggressive in terms of timeline. Um, in any case, passed in November of uh, 2016 um, by a close margin. Uh, virtually the next day, the legislature said not so fast. They put a six month moratorium on it and said nothing's going to happen until we study this and decide whether to go forward or whether to modify uh, the voter initiative. It took eight months. Um, and then in July of uh, 2017, uh, the legislature uh, passed and, and Governor Baker signed um, um, Section 55, which now um, allowed for the adult use of marijuana by, uh, for recreational purposes. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, uh, the Cannabis Commission, the Control Commission was appointed. Um, one of the questions that uh, Professor Lucien um, asked me to cover is, is um, how I got the job. I think my qualifications um, uh, fit with what the, uh, the qualifications uh, were for the chairman of the commission. Um, it was actually uh, pretty simple. Um, uh, Secretary, uh, excuse me, Treasurer Goldberg was responsible for appointing the, uh, the chairman. Um, she reached out to Stan Rosenberg, who at that time was the um, president of the Senate. Um, president or President Rosenberg reached out through his network, ran into a friend of mine. My friend said, hey, I got the perfect person for this job, but he'll never do it. Um, I got asked if I would do it. I said, of course not, not in a million years. And my wife, um, bless her heart, um, uh, is the reason I'm here because she said, essentially, and I'm using much cleaner language than she used, um, she said, are you out of your mind? This is, the, uh, this is the adventure of a lifetime. How could you not do it? And here I am, um, three years into uh, my five-year term. And as always, my wife was right. This is the adventure of a lifetime. <laughs> so uh, we got appointed uh, uh, September 1st of 2017. And uh, as I said, it was a, a, an incredibly short time frame and timeline. Um, the first mandate that we had was to have regulations in place by March of 2018, and, and we did hit that mandate. Um, uh, we uh, released our first set of regulations March 15th of 2018. And um, I, I was very proud because it was from a standing start. Uh, when we first got appointed, there were five commissioners. Because we're an independent commission, we're appointed by the treasurer and the governor and the attorney general, but we don't report to them. Uh, because we're independent, we not only um, had no staff, we had no office because we weren't part of any agency. Um, and from a standing start, um, we just, you know, the five commissioners essentially rolled up our sleeves and became our own staff and got uh, the uh, regulations in place by March 15th. Um, we went through an arduous process of meeting in public. Everything we do is, uh, is governed by the open meeting law. So uh, we met in public, we debated policies, we drafted regulations consistent, consistent with those policies. We promulgated those uh, those uh, draft regulations. We had public hearings and a public comment period. We revised um, some things based upon that. And then uh, we promulgated our final regulations uh, in March of uh, in March of 2018. Um, it, it's a good uh, time, I think, to pause and just talk about some key elements um, of the law that were embedded in our first set of regulations. Um, there's, um, I think, three things that are, are pretty important in terms of how this has played out. One is that Massachusetts has a long uh, tradition of local control. And so while we are the only authority that gives out licenses, there, it's not like alcohol where there's local licensing, we are the only authority that gives out um, licenses um, in the state. Um, cities and towns have significant roles in the, uh, in the process. Um, and there are really two. One is um, cities and towns can ban or limit 
the number of marijuana establishments in their town. Uh, the law is kind of like Solomon, um, uh, a Solomonic decision um, in that if the city or town voted in favor of question four, they can't ban except through a, a subsequent voter initiative. Um, but if they voted against question four, they can just ban through a mandate through their selectmen, mayor, whatever their governing uh, body is. Um, and a significant number of citizen towns have banned um, uh, marijuana establishments. I think it's up to uh, about 60 of the 351 citizen towns in the state. The other things that many cities and towns did is when we promulgated our regulations in March of 2018, uh, they said, oh, we didn't think you were gonna be so quick. And so they requested moratoria from the attorney general's office and well over a hundred cities and towns in the state got moratoria extending through the end of 2018 so they could do their own planning and zoning and so forth. So that, that really slowed us down. Um, the other thing that cities and towns uh, have is, uh, as, as a say in the matter is that we cannot even consider a license application unless there is a host community agreement that has been signed between the city and town and the applicant. And uh, there are 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, as I said, there are 351 different experiments going on about how to do host community agreements. Um, and the law is a little bit ambiguous. So the law says that the host community agreements can contain um, a mitigation fee, essentially a fee that offsets the incremental costs that the cities or towns are going to incur because they are hosting a marijuana establishment. The law is very explicit that says if there are mitigation fees, they can only be for 3% of revenue. They can only last for five years. They have to be documented and explicitly offsetting actual expenses incurred because uh, of hosting a, a marijuana establishment. Um, I will tell you that it's all over the map. There are some cities and towns that are asking for 4%. There are some cities and towns that are asking for a flat fee. There are some cities and towns that have a, um, uh, an auto renew in this, so it's really technically more than a five-year contract. Um, and the law is very ambiguous about who, if anybody, has authority to um, uh, monitor and to take action against these abuses. Um, the legislature thinks we have it. Um, our general counsel thinks we don't have it. Um, two law, two uh, um, lawsuits that got litigated, um, the judges both ruled that we did not have authority. And so it's a little bit of a mess. Um, this is currently, we ask the legislature to clarify um, who had authority and to ask them to give us the authority. Um, that legislation came out of committee. It is somewhere in the legislature. Um, I don't know when or if it's going to pass, but it, it does It does create the potential for, for abuse by cities and towns. And I don't wanna paint with a broad brush and say that every city and town has been guilty, some have not. Uh, but there are a number of city or towns that are using this, I think, uh, to their uh, their advantage and to the disadvantage of applicants, particularly ap applicants that are less well-funded. Um, if you're well-funded, you can go to cities and towns, you've got lawyers, you can negotiate, you can pay these fees. If you're not well-funded, it's, it's a drug, uh, significant barrier to entry, which gets into the second part of the law, which is the law has very explicit mandates about um, diversity um, in terms of gender and ethnicity. It has uh, very specific objectives with respect to creating opportunities for small businesses, not precluding large businesses from participating, but making sure there's room for small businesses um, as well, and uh, promoting farming in Massachusetts, particularly outdoor cultivation. But the, uh, the most explicit mandate in the legislation is uh, the mandate that we ensure that those communities that were disproportionately impacted by marijuana prohibition are full participants in the new industry that we're building. And in classic legislative fashion, um, that mandate is very explicit, but there are a few things that are left uh, unsaid, which is what is a disproportionately impacted community? How do you identify them? What are the criteria for deciding what's a disproportionately impacted community? And two, what does full participation mean? Uh, neither of those were addressed by the legislation. Um, we had to do our own work. We came up with a set of criteria that had to do with arrest and incarceration rates, um, net income, unemployment rates. And we did it by city, except for the bigger cities and towns where we went down literally, literally to the neighborhood and ended up designating 29 areas that were disproportionately impacted by marijuana prohibition. We also define full participation as exactly that, which is not just employment opportunities, but 
management opportunities, equity ownership opportunities, full participation in the industry. And uh, that has been our challenge and quite honestly, our biggest struggle um, in the three years that we've, uh, we've been doing this. So we uh, we got through the initial regulations. Can I, I'm going to pause. I, I realize I, I've kind of been going nonstop. Um, anybody have any questions or in, um, Professor Lucien? Do you have? Any? I can only see a few of you. So I, I, if you have a question, good think, so far. Okay, if you have any questions, Thank I think you. you need to you need to use your text function, I guess, to uh, um, send uh, a question to, uh, to Professor Lucien. Yeah, absolutely. You can you can you can definitely send it in the chat, and, and I'll and I'll transmit it. Okay. So let me, let me keep going, but please, uh, please feel free to uh, to stop me to ask questions. Um, okay, I, we have something. Does Colorado provide any gu guidance on regulations? Um, thank you for that question. Uh, so when we started, uh, we reached out to um, all the states that had uh, preceded us, um, including Colorado, Oregon, and Washington, um, and uh, you know they were incredibly helpful. First of all, they were absolutely willing to talk. They answered all of our questions. They were very open about lessons learned and things they wish, you know, they, um, if they had a chance, they could have done differently or better. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was extraordinarily helpful. I actually got a great deal of appreciation for, for them, particularly the guys in Colorado, um, guys being a gender neutral term, but uh, particularly the people that were working on this in Colorado, because they had no roadmap, they had no precedent, they had nobody to turn to for help. And, uh, you know, I think they made some mistakes. They're the first to admit it, but it was, still pretty impressive what they did with no precedent and, and nobody to kind of learn from. Um, we have adopted because of the help we got from, from those states, um, a policy, we'll talk to anybody. And so I've been down to Virginia, I've been to Rhode Island, I've been to New York, um, I've been to Illinois, um, as have all my fellow commissioners. Um, we'll just talk to anybody. We'll answer any questions they have. You know, for those that are that are following us, uh, we try to be as open and honest as we can be about what we've learned. So the answer is, yeah, Colorado was very helpful. I will tell you though that you know you can't just do a lift and shift. You can't just look at what Colorado did and say, okay, well let's just you know bring it over to Massachusetts. Uh, the states are very different um, in terms of demographics. Um, the states are very different um, in terms of. The legislation um, is very different. We are the only state still now, well, actually, Illinois is now the second state um, that has explicit diversity and social justice mandates in our legislation. So stuff is happening in California as an example, but it's all happening in some counties. There is no statewide mandate for social justice in California. We were, at the time, the only state that had that kind of mandate. Um, as I said, uh, Illinois actually kind of copied our legislation and put it into theirs, which is great. Um, but, you know, so you can't just lift and shift because um, things are different. Um, we are also unique in terms of governance. So I mentioned before, we were appointed by the Attorney General president or attorney, I wish the president, attorney general, treasurer and governor, um, but we are independent. Um, no other state um, that has adult use marijuana has an independent agency regulating the industry. Um, they're all part of treasury or um, alcoholic beverages or some other state function. We are the only standalone independent agency. So we learned a lot from Colorado, Oregon and Washington, but uh, um, you know, we had to um, obviously adapt things to the specifics of Massachusetts. Um, we, uh, the second mandate we had after we um, um, uh, issued our initial regulations in March of 2018 was that by April 1st, so we had two weeks to catch our breath. And then by April 1st, 2018, we had to start accepting license applications. Uh, we did. Um, the, the next mandate is pretty interesting because um, it, uh, We've been criticized for how long it took. You know, the voter initiative uh, was in uh, November of 2016. The first stores you can see here didn't open until 20, November 2018. So it's about two years. But the legislation was interesting because not only, well, first of all, there was the eight month hi hiatus when the legislators studied the issue and put everything on hold. But then in the legislation, it said, well, we had to start accepting applications on April 1st, 2018. We could not approve any applications until June of 2018. And so it was kind of a negative mandate. And so we literally approved our first provisional licenses. I think it was June 20th of uh, 2018 and took a few months thereafter for the first uh, retail stores to open. And they opened uh, um, two of them in, in Leicester um, and uh, East Hampton opened in uh, November of 2018, just right before, uh, right before uh, Thanksgiving. 
Um, I'll give you some statistics. So from that starting point in November of 2018, um, we now have um, on the adult use side only, so I'm not talking about medical right now, on the adult use side, there are 156 um, marijuana enterprises operational in the state, um, including uh, 38 cultivators, 34 manufacturers, 77 retailers. Um, we have um, in our pipeline, uh, another 355 provisional applications. So we are early, early in the process. Um, the first full year of operation, um, the industry did about $300 million of revenue. Um, in the fiscal year that um, uh, started uh, July 1st of 2020 and uh, will end uh, June 30th, 2021, uh, we'll do about a billion. Um, the industry will do about a billion. Um, I think at maturity, it's going to be about a $200 billion, or, uh, excuse me, a $2 billion industry in the state of Massachusetts, maybe two and a half billion. And uh, as I mentioned, we have 77 operating retail stores right now. My, my guess is that the state can sustain somewhere in the neighborhood of 200. Um, you know, and and it's, it, that, it's hard for me to forecast because one of the lessons I've learned here is that you know, we can have all these objectives in terms of how many licenses you want to give out and to whom we want to give them. Uh, we can't force anybody to apply for a license, and I can't give a license to somebody that hasn't applied for it. So it's a little bit hard to forecast, but my, my point is not to provide a point forecast as much as to say we're early in the evolution of this industry. Um, you know, we're uh, maybe uh, maybe a third or 40 percent of the way into it. Um, I think it was wise that the um, um, appointing authority, the legislation and the appointing authorities um, gave, gave us a five-year term um, because it's going to take at least another two years before this industry matures and stabilizes. And it's, it's, it's still going to evolve after that point, but it's going to certainly be another couple of years, I think, before we could start saying this industry is stable and mature. Uh, so let me see. Uh, Stowell Simonton. What are the, I'm sorry, I, let me see if I got it. What are the typical expenses municipalities claim to endure when they request a 3%? It's not 3% of profits, it's 3% of revenue. Um, but it's typically around things like police details, um, you know, for the stores, you know, particularly when, uh, when the stores first open, as you probably read in the paper, there are, tend to be long lines and traffic and, and congestion. Um, they, you know, this is where it gets sticky because they, they start talking about not just direct expenses like police details, but they start talking about um, uh, drug education um, as an example. And, it, you know, I can argue that either way. I mean, you know, it, it certainly is related to cannabis, um, whether it's directly resultant or the need of that is directly resultant because a, a store opened in town uh, is a little less clear to me. Um, but you see that where, where you see some, um, in my opinion, egregious violations are where you start getting into things like fire trucks, um, parks, uh, voluntary don't quote voluntary donations. Um, that's where you know it starts getting a little egregious. But as I said, um, there unfortunately is no governing authority um, on this, um, and uh, and you know I, I I will not accuse all all. 351 cities and towns of playing games, but but a number of them are. And of course, you're all aware of the one that played the biggest game, which is in Fall River, where um, the uh, former mayor, currently indicted ex-mayor, um, was demanding bribes from people, or at least allegedly was demanding bribes from people um, to get host community agreements from them. Um, and that's right now in, in, you know, in, in process of being litigated. So, uh, you know, um, there are some obvious expenses, but, um, you know, as you as you get more and more aggressive. And, and the other thing is that, you know, the law says it can be up to three percent based upon legitimate expenses that the city or town is incurring. I will tell you that there is not one host community agreement in the entire state that is less than three percent. So, you know, the, I think cities and towns are looking at this as a source of, 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 of revenue. And when we get into delivery, I'll tell you another story about cities and towns that I find quite ironic in terms of their quest for revenue, but let's uh, let's keep going. So um, the um, first retail stores opened, as I said, in November. Um, um, we're opening, you know, um, half a dozen or so a month. And I'm, I'm proud, you know, we get criticized a lot um, about one, one of the things the treasurer asked me when I was first talking to her about taking this job, uh, literally the first question she said is, do you have thick skin? 
and I said, I don't know. I've never been in the public eye before, but I'm, you know, I'm pretty harsh self-critic. So I think I do, but, uh, you know, nothing, nothing could prepare anybody. I don't believe for the fact that this is an incredibly controversial issue. It's passionate. It is evenly divided, um, pro and con across the state and pretty much whatever we do, um, we'll get criticism, which, which is fine. I'm kind of viewing uh, my success as if I'm criticized, if we're criticized by all sides, I think we're doing okay. It's only, if we only get criticized by one side, I worry about that a little bit, but it, it comes from all sides. And so we have been criticized for moving slowly in terms of this industry. We've been also criticized for moving too quickly. Um, we have tried to use our, our best judgment. I think Governor Baker uh, said it right, which is he said, um, you only get one chance to roll this industry out. Might as well do it right. And I am proud of the fact that, you know, it has rolled out with relatively little controversy. Uh, um, you know, things, things, are, things are relatively smooth, knock on wood. Um, because the industry is evolving slowly and we still have a lot of room for, uh, for growth and, and, addition and new entrants, um, we have opportunities to, to do more with diversity, to do more with helping people from disproportionately impact communities where if we started on day one and flipped the light switch, um, it would have been too late because the only people that would have been ready to go on day one were the well-funded out-of-staters, the guys that were running marijuana, uh, medical marijuana dispensaries. They certainly were there on day one, but they haven't taken over the industry. There's still room for the smaller um, and more diverse players that were, were, were totally committed to getting into the marketplace. Um, we took over the medical. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, um, so yeah, that's, it's a great question from Andy. Um, with uh, 156 establishments and 355 in the pipeline, and, and that's 355 are the provisional licenses we've already issued. There are another 4,000 applications in the queue, most of which are not complete and many of which will never get completed, but there's still more behind those 355. So it's a great question. Um, we decided um, on day one that we were not going to limit the number of establishments um, in the state. We, we took some steps to try to ensure that there wouldn't be dramatic oversupply. Uh, I don't know how many of you followed uh, the states that preceded us. Oregon has a horrible, horrible situation where there's just dramatic oversupply to the point where the state legislature in Oregon actually considered about a year, a year and a half ago, they actually considered authorizing out-of-state um, exports of marijuana which as you know is <laughs> extremely and extraordinarily federally illegal um and as uh, our u.s attorney um, andrew lelling has said but uh, most of the other u.s attorneys as well um they said you know we're gonna you know we're, we're not gonna endorse something that is federally illegal but we're gonna leave you alone as long as there are three things that you don't do one is you don't let kids under 21 have access Two is you ensure that there's no criminal money that comes in to finance these businesses. And third is you prevent diversion. And diversion is either something grown in Massachusetts, sold in another state, or something that's grown in another state and sold in Massachusetts. I.e., if this stuff starts crossing state lines, you're going to have a problem. Nonetheless, the Oregon legislature considered that legislation. Thankfully, they didn't pass it. Uh, but they do have a, a, a tremendous oversupply. Washington, a little less, Washington State, a little less, but in both Oregon and Washington, uh, the prices have plummeted. Um, and, you know, you can say, well, that's good for the consumer, um, but it's bad for producers. Um, and, you know, to just show you where the, where the, the issue and the power is, it's bad for the states that are looking at this as a, you know, a new source of tax revenue. And most states, not all of them, most states are um, taxing on revenue. And if you're taxing on revenue and prices plummet, your, your tax rates obviously, or your tax collections obviously suffer. So, so we, uh, we've done something in um, cultivation where we have uh, tiers. So there's 11 tiers that you can get a license for starting it up to 5,000 5, square feet. And the, the biggest tier is up to 100,000 square feet. You can only have um, across three licenses um, a max of 100,000 square uh, feet per entity. Um, so that's one way to limit uh, it. But we also require that you sell at least 80% of what you produce. 
So if you have a license that gives you, you know, the the ability to do uh, cultivate 100,000 square feet, you've got to sell the produce or the product of 80,000 square feet, or else you get relegate you get relegated down to a lower tier. So we're trying to ensure that the only thing that gets sold that gets grown in the state actually gets sold in the state, and we'll see. I mean, I, I'm I'm viewing this. This this is going to sound a little. Uh, I'm um, academic, but um, I, I, this is an experiment. I mean, you know, I'm an economist by training, as you saw uh, uh, on my resume. Um, and I, I spent uh, my early career doing econometric models and forecasting um, businesses and industries. You know, this one's impossible to forecast. Um, it's unprecedented. Um, and I think the philosophy, I know the philosophy we've adopted is we put our regulations in place in March of 2018. We, I think, did the best, I know we did the best we could, making judgments and saying, this is, you know, this is the right way to do it with an explicit statement that I made at the time. And I continue to reiterate, which is we're going to see what happens. And I'm sure things are going to evolve differently than what we anticipated in some cases better, in some cases worse, and we'll adjust. And so we went through the initial round of regulations um, in March of 2018. We have done three subsequent rounds, including one that we're in the middle of right now, where we have taken things that we've learned and seen how the marketplace has evolved in different ways than we could have anticipated, and we've adjusted. So that's a long-winded answer to what I thought a great question for uh, from Andy. Um, you know, we'll see. Um, we we think we ha we have a control um, or have a, an ability to cap production so it doesn't get out of hand like it does in like it has in other states. Um, but we, uh, we actually thought it was important not to cap the number of licenses because we didn't want to create that kind of competition. I mean, there is competition, as, 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 as Professor Lucian knows, in, in town by town, because most towns have limited the number of licenses they're going to give out. Um, but we didn't want to create that kind of competition in the state where there was a finite number of licenses and there were losers and winners. Um, there will be losers and winners, not, you know, I have to say this oftentimes, and I sound a little bit um, uh, pedantic, and I apologize. We, we give out licenses to operate a business. We do not give out licenses that guarantee you're going to make a good living or a good income. Not all the licenses we give out are going to be successful businesses. And I don't think it's our role to ensure success. Our role is to give people an opportunity and to and make sure it's a, a, a level and fair playing uh, field. So... Um, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're continuing to go. There's been a couple of uh, interesting hiccups along the way that you're, you're I'm sure, familiar with, uh, one of which was the vaping crisis uh, in, back in, uh, you know, what, <laughs> what I thought was uh, um, a, uh, I thought was a big deal at the time compared to COVID. It's, it, was, it was not quite as big a deal, but at the time it was, and, and it was serious. I mean, you know, there are a number of people that, that died from vaping, um, both marijuana and tobacco. Um, there was not a lot of data, unfortunately, about a um, few things, you know, what products were people using, whether they bought them on the, host, on the uh, uh, regulated market or on the black market, whether it was tobacco, whether it was, uh, whether it was uh, uh, marijuana, some mixture. It, it, there really was no, no way to kind of figure out what was going on, at least initially, but people were dying and it was really important to take action. So the governor... Um, uh, declared an emergency order. He delegated to uh, the Secretary of uh, the Department of Public Health um, the ability to take steps to deal with the public emergency, and she um, put in place in uh, the fall of 2019, um, I think it was September, she put in place a complete ban on all vaping products in the state of Massachusetts, including both tobacco vaping as well as marijuana vaping products. And uh, unsurprisingly, there was a gigantic uproar, uh, not from us, because we don't make policy, we implement policy, uh, but uh, two groups. Um, one is the um, people that ran tobacco stores, convenience stores, um, all of a sudden had a significant amount of their revenue taken away from them. So they sued the governor. But the other group that sued the governor were the medical marijuana patients, um, many of whom said, I need marijuana um, and the only way that my system can accept it and the most effective way to ingest it is through vaping. And um, they sued as well. Um, I'll make a, a little side comment here. They made a very compelling case 
um, the medical marijuana patients, so there's an MPAA, the medical, the medical patients uh, association. Um, they made a very compelling case, but it underscored what I think is a gigantic issue, particularly around medical marijuana, which is because of the federal prohibition, there is no research. If you uh, are a teaching hospital or a university uh, and you get federal funding, which of course they all do, you will not do research on the efficacy of medical marijuana. And it's, 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 it's horrifying because their medical marijuana does not cure anything, but it is incredibly effective dealing with some sim symptoms. But I, only, I can only tell you that anecdotally. There is no science. And so when the, uh, the Medical uh, Patients Association sued the governor, they made a compelling case, but there was no science behind that case because there is no science, unfortunately. Um, so the judge uh, threw out the case that the uh, retailers, um, the you know, convenience store operators, um, he threw that case out, said, no, the governor has the absolute authority um, um, to do that. Uh, but he actually found in favor of the medical marijuana patients. And, and essentially the ruling was that because of the independence of the Cannabis Control Commission, the governor had no authority on how to regulate marijuana. That we, the C Cannabis Control Commission, were the only agency in the state that had the authority to regulate marijuana. So the ruling essentially allowed the tobacco vaping ban to continue but essentially said the governor had a week to undo the ban. And so he un undid the ban, but then we had a week to figure out whether we were gonna put it in place or not. Or, you know, because again, we didn't have any data, we didn't have any information. Um, I, I'm frustrated by the fact that the Department of Public Health um, who was tracking this crisis didn't share their data with us. They, they, they used patient privacy as a reason for not sharing data. So we, we were completely operating in the dark. Um, we essentially um, put a ban in place for all products that were on the shelves and then put in place very strict requirements for manufacturing and testing for future products, which are now allowed to be sold. But we still have a significant amount of unused inventory that we get yelled at every day. Um, from the uh, from the uh, medical dispensary operators that we just literally don't know what to do with. We we can't we can't say it's safe. We can't say it's unsafe. We can't force them to uh, destroy this inventory because we don't have a basis for doing that. But none of us are willing to say it's safe. Go ahead and sell it. So it's a it's a complicated uh, situation, and uh, you know it's a. Uh, I feel good with what we did there, but uh, you know, I also, uh, as I said, it just underscored to me how problematic it is that there's no science, particularly on the medical side um, of uh, the of the marijuana um, industry, and and that's unfortunate. And uh, you know, I'm I'm getting a little nostalgic as I now I'm seeing the backside of my term. I got you know two years, a little under two years left. Um, there's still more work to do, obviously, but I'm starting to get a little bit reflective um, about my legacy and accomplishments and. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, dealing with this issue and trying to get the medical marijuana industry or the, the the medical profession more engaged in the industry is a very important part of what I hope to accomplish over the next couple of years. Um, it's it's an uphill battle, but uh, I think it's it's really important. So that was vaping, um, and uh, um, as I mentioned, we've gone through several rounds of regulatory uh, review. Um, the last one before the one we're in currently was in the fall of 2019. Um, and I'm going to jump back a little bit in history. When we did our first regulations in uh, March of 2018, we actually authorized license categories for home delivery um, of, um, and for social consumption. Um, both of those are very important social justice issues. Um, home delivery is important because it is by far the lowest capital requirement of any license type. So it, it gets, it's just easier for the people we're trying to enable to get into this industry, makes it a lot easier because there's not a lot of capital available in this industry. So home, de home delivery is important. People want it from an access standpoint, consumers want it. But for us, it's always been um, a really important part of our equity and social justice objectives. So we, we authorize that. Social consumption, we also authorize. Social consumption is pot cafes. Um, or as, as the Boston Globe so elegantly put it, pot yoga, where, you know, you can get some pot and while you're stretching, you know, you can get high. Um, uh, we got 
as I said, you know, we went through the normal regulatory process, which is published draft regulations, had public hearings and public comment, came back and debated whether to make any changes based on that. We got annihilated on delivery and on social consumption by literally every elected official in the state, the entire law enforcement community. Um, people were just, it's too soon. It's too soon. And, you know, this is another uh, uh, Charlie Bakerism. He said, why don't you walk a little bit before you start running? Um, and uh, we listened. We, we did listen. Um, and we actually did put off both social consumption and delivery on our initial regulations, but explicitly said, we're not just putting it off, we're putting in place a, a timeline. And by the fall of next year, so a year after the first store opens, we're going to get back into this. And so in November of, of 2019, um, we did authorize delivery and social consumption. Um, delivery um, is complicated and it's still on the agenda for the meeting we're having tomorrow. I'll get into that in a second. Um, social consumption, um, I, I wanna mention, I, I said social consumption is also a, uh, an equity and social justice issue. The reason it is, it's, it's an expensive business to start. So it doesn't have the low capital that the delivery business does, but social consumption is important to me and I think the commission, because right now the law is you can smoke in your own home unless you live in a rental unit, in which case your landlord can tell you you can't smoke at home. If you live in federally subsidized housing, by definition, you cannot smoke at home. And so for people that you know, are in that situation where they're not allowed to smoke in their own homes, don't wanna smoke in front of their kids or whatever, they've got no place to go. Cause it's still illegal, by the way, I hope you guys all know this, it is still illegal to smoke on the street. It's never enforced, but it is illegal. So social consumption to me is, is very important as a way to just give people a place to be safe um, if they can't smoke in their own homes. Um, that got incredibly complicated. We did approve it in November of 2019. Um, we were immediately told by the uh, Secretary of State's office that cities and towns couldn't opt in except through a formal voter initiative um, and that they had to have that voter initiative um, and, and there was no, excuse me, there was no mechanism in place for them to have that initiative. So it's, you know, a little bit of a catch-22. You can't do it without the initiative, but there's no way to do the initiative. Uh, we have filed, we have requested and legislation has been filed. Um, it's in the same uh, status as, you know, the host community agreement legislation. It's gotten out of committee. Uh, it's got support. Um, I don't know where it's at, but, but social consumption cannot happen until, uh, until this law passes, unfortunately. So we've got delivery. Um, we actually approved at our last public meeting, which was last Thursday, um, our first two delivery provisional licenses. So we're just getting going with that, but uh, um, I'll, I'll skip ahead and we'll come back to the uh, governor's order about COVID. Um, while we um, were uh, doing home delivery, we got a lot of feedback. The, the way we structured home delivery was essentially, it was, it was, it was kind of like Uber Eats. Um, or, or Grubhub. So what we allowed is for people to contract with retailers and deliver on behalf of those retailers. So the delivery companies were couriers. They're, they didn't ever possess the product. They just transported on behalf of retailers. They didn't actually you know, sell the product. The transaction was between the retailer and the customer. Um, but, but you know, people make a living doing Grubhub or doing uh, you know doing uh, um, Uber Eats. Um, but we got a lot of pushback um, that you know that people found that too restrictive um, and pushed very hard for a broader definition of delivery, which would allow people to actually buy from cultivators or manufacturers and sell directly to consumers. So on the table for tomorrow, uh, we have a public meeting tomorrow. We did our draft regulations a couple weeks ago. We had public comments over the last couple of weeks. On the table for our public meeting tomorrow at 10 a.m. is do we want to go forward with this expanded definition of home delivery, which again allows people to buy from cultivators, manufacturers, and sell directly to consumers, warehouse. Um, it's it's gotten, you know more controversy than literally anything else that we've done in our three years. Um, it's amazing. Um, so you've got the legislature saying, we don't have the right to do this. Um, they're talking about the intent 
of the law. Um, no one's shown us anything in the legislation that says we can't do it. But they said, well, we meant to prohibit this. Um, so we're getting, we're getting the legislature yelling at us. Um, the uh, industry is yelling at us because think about this. This, this is going to make it harder for the retailers because now people can buy directly from these, these uh, delivery companies, um, not go into the store. And uh, you know, it's Amazon against the retailers, uh, hopefully on a smaller scale. And we're gonna do some things to make sure that there's not one big Amazon that takes this entire business over. But the retailers are yelling at us and saying, hey, you didn't tell us we're gonna have this kind of competition. Well, that, that's not really true. Um, and, you know, but I, if I was a retailer, I'd, I'd be saying the same thing. Um, but the the thing I find most ironic um, is the cities and towns are yelling at us, and the cities and towns, many of whom totally resisted retail, um, kept it out of their their towns for as long as possible. Said, "But this business is so important to us. This retail business it generates so much tax revenue. Now you're gonna you're gonna you know you're gonna make the uh, the tax dollars go away." I, I find it at least a little ironic that the city and towns have totally changed their tune in the last couple of weeks. But, uh, and I'm not gonna offer you a forecast, um, which is what's gonna happen tomorrow. I mean, the way we work commission, um, we, have, we, we take the open meeting law very seriously. I mean, literally the second day that we were on our job, the five commissioners, we had a full day training session from the attorney general's office on the open meeting law. And the first thing that they said was, the open meeting law was never designed for an agency like yours. It was designed for part-time town selectmen who are you know, doing deals behind closed doors. But nonetheless, it applies to you and you've got to adhere to it. And we do. We absolutely do. What the open meeting law says is essentially that if there are more than two commissioners, there's a quorum, we cannot have any conversation related to anything um, about this industry and our jobs except in public. So we do everything in public. We have had, I, I actually have, I have not let anybody tell me the answer to this question about how many public meetings we've had in three years, because I would die if I knew the answer, but it's, it, it's literally dozens. If not, we're probably getting close to a hundred because it's the only way we can do our work. Um, and I respect the open meeting law and I respect the intent of the open meeting law. Um, I have said to the governor and others that if um, someone was designing a law to make it as difficult as possible for us to operate efficiently, it would be the open meeting law, however. Uh, that being said, um, so we're, we're meeting tomorrow. Uh, we have draft regulations to create this additional kind of uh, delivery license, um, but we have gotten an enormous amount of passionate feedback, uh, mostly negative. Um, and we're going to meet and in public, we'll decide, you know, we'll debate and discuss and decide what to do. Um, so I think tomorrow's going to be, if guys are not doing anything at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, um, everything is streamed, um, you know, in, in, in our COVID days, everything is streamed. We used to be in person in public, but now everything's streamed. Um, you know, it's going to be, it's, it, I, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, democracy in action. It, it, it really is. So, uh, we'll see what happens, but, uh, it's, a, I, I don't mean to make light of it because delivery is really important. It's an incredibly important part of us meeting our equity and, uh, and, uh, social justice objectives. Let me say there's a question here. No, the answer is you cannot, there, there's certain limitations. So first of all, um, the question, uh, you can't call a meeting of the five of you to go over things to discuss confidential information. Um, no, you have to have public meetings. Again, any anything that's more than two commissioners um, has to be done in public. But you can um, go into executive session. And there's well-defined exceptions in the open meeting law about what, what reasons you can go into executive session for. Um, one example is union contract negotiations. Um, if you're going to talk about somebody's performance, um, you can do that in executive session. So, you know, um, Professor Lucien would know better than I do. There's, I think there's eight or, or, or nine specific reasons that allow you to go into executive session. Uh, but you've got to state those reasons ahead of time. Um, and then, um, while what happens in executive session stays confidential, it only stays confidential for as long as that reason stays in place. 
So once the union contract is, is, is agreed to, then all the notes and minutes from that executive session become part of the public record. But as long as whatever the issue is that, that caused you to invoke executive session stays in place, you keep confidential uh, what goes on in executive session. So um, we, for instance, um, our last meeting, you know, we, uh, we, the bulk of the meeting is processing license applications. Our staff, you know, does the research in the background. They make a recommendation uh, to the commission and then we discuss and vote on licenses. Um, um, the Fall River investigation, which I mentioned, you know, the ex-mayor uh, indicted for accepting bribes. Um, the U.S. Attorney's Office um, has not named the companies that accepted bribes. There's company one, company two, company three in the indictment. Um, we have our own ideas because we, you know, we've looked at the dates and we, we think we can figure it out, but we don't know for sure ourselves. So um, when a applicant from Fall River is on our agenda, as it was last week, um, we, you know, we have a hard time approving it because we don't know whether they're culpable or not. I don't want to deny a license to an innocent party, but I certainly don't want to give out a license to a culpable party. Um, the U.S. Attorney has um, allowed us to get confidential information from them about as long as we do not release it publicly. So that was a perfect example of why we went into executive session to talk about that particular license application. Um, so anyway, um, tomorrow's gonna be very interesting. Um, and as I said, delivery is incredibly important, but incredibly controversial. I, I, I actually think, and I, I don't think this is an overstatement, I actually think that it's as controversial as anything we've covered in the three years that uh, we've been doing this. Um, last thing, uh, let me talk about, let me just talk about um, the executive order on COVID. Um, so the, the uh, governor, um, as you know, uh, issued executive order in March, um, shut down all non-essential businesses, did not consult with us, uh, not that, and he had no you know, requirement to do so. I, I wish he had, but he had no requirement to do so. Um, and he determined that the medical dispensaries were essential and allowed them to stay open but decided that the or declared determined, <coughs> excuse me, um, that the uh, adult use uh, retail stores were not essential businesses and ordered them all shut. He got sued on that as well. Um, and he, he prevailed. Um, and I actually think that was right. It is, I, I can agree or disagree with his decision, but I believe he has the absolute right to make that decision. Um, but um, it was uh, it was it was hard. We had about uh, I think 39 stores open at that time, um, if I remember my uh, numbers correctly. Maybe maybe closer to 40 um, or, or 45, um, and they were all shut down literally overnight. And uh, the the most tragic one, of course, was Pure Oasis, which um, was the first uh, retail store to open in Boston, the first economic empowerment um, applicant, so somebody that qualified for you know our programs to help disproportionately impact communities. Um, they literally opened their store like three days before they were shut down by the governor's order. Three days. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the industry did sue. Um, I, I, to the extent that I have a say, I don't have a say, but I, the people do listen to me. Um, I said, you're absolutely doing the wrong thing. Please don't do it. But they went ahead and, and, and sued. They, they, did, they lost. Um, and the store stayed closed for about uh, three months until uh, the governor uh, uh, allow them to reopen first for curbside delivery only, um, uh, but now uh, with social distancing and 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 limited capacity, they can do in-store operations. I was uh, totally convinced we were going to uh, um, lose some significant percentage of these stores. They just never they wouldn't make it through. They would not reopen. I'm I'm deeply happy and gratified and surprised um, that they all they all made it through and they all reopened. Uh, you know, cause capital is short in this business and there are not, there are not too many people that are well capitalized enough to deal with three months of zero revenue. Uh, but they, they managed to, to make it through and I'm, I'm, I'm deeply, uh, I'm deeply grateful. Um, you know, I'm not making any forecasts about what's going to happen in the future. Um, you know, we're obviously not out of the woods yet with respect to COVID. Uh, I, I am not, as I said, being consulted by the governor um, on this, uh, nor, you know, and that, that's, that's his prerogative. So I, I don't know what, what's going to happen, but uh, it certainly, it certainly had an impact on the industry, but uh, less 
than I anticipated. Um, I think I'm, I'm really proud. We, we took some steps um, right away when they, uh, when the governor said that medical stores could stay open. Um, we uh, instantaneously allowed them to do curbside delivery, which was not allowed before then. Uh, but we we did that. Um, we to get a, um, a patient card in Massachusetts so you can get into a medical dispensary, you need a certified professional, a physician, a uh, RN, or a, a physician assistant to certify that you have one of the qualifying conditions. Um, we had historically required that initial consultation to get that um, certification to be in person. We immediately changed our regulations so you could do it through telemedicine. So I, I'm really proud of the way we kind of you know adapted and responded and we're very, very flexible. And, you know, uh, the industry, you know, has gotten through it. Um, although, as I said, none of us, including the industry, but none of us are out of the woods here. Uh, first, Lucian, I'm noticing it's close to nine. What would you like to do? You can keep rocking out. Uh, really? Okay. Uh, how long would you like me to keep rocking out for? Um, honestly, as long as you would like. I've, I've buffered in enough time towards the end of the semester to take care of um, uh, content that I don't go over. So you can keep going. This, I think this is more, uh, this is better than what, what I was going to go over today anyways. Who wants to hear about banking? Uh, I love banking. Okay. So uh, question is, is there a link tomorrow? Um, please, if you go to our website, which I'm looking at right now, which is, uh, huh, I should know our website, don't you think? It's masscannabiscontrol.com. So that's pretty easy. MassCannabisControl.com. If you go to our website, they'll right on the front, right on the landing page will be the link to the meeting tomorrow. Okay. So now I got a lot of questions. Okay. Bob no. Okay. Great question. Uh, was PPP money available uh, for the CARES Act for small businesses? Um, absolutely. Great question. And unfortunately, the answer is absolutely not. Um, the PPP was administered by the Small Business Administration. It's a federal program. Um, and, and, you know, I, I did, you know, I said, I, I, I'm not going to take on the governor. It's not my role. Um, and nor is it smart. Um, but, um, when he did shut the, um, store, the, uh, adult use stores down in, uh, in, uh, March of this year, um, what I said was not that he didn't have the right to do it. Not that it was the wrong decision, but I said, somebody needs to understand that these people are being, they, they don't have, they're not getting helped. Everybody, you know, everybody else is getting helped. Um, I tried to push both our federal um, con congressional re um, representation as well as state to do something about it. Um, got a little momentum there, but by the time, you know, things were starting to move, uh, he reopened it. But uh, the answer is no. And, and, and it, it's tragic. I mean, one of the things that uh, Professor Lucien asked me to um, um, comment on is uh, what I think is going to happen at the federal level. And I don't know. Um, you know, the 75% of the country and 75% of the legislature believes it should be legalized. Um, I, I, I won't predict, I think it will happen. What I won't predict is, um, when it'll happen. Um, and so, you know, we are operating, um, I think it's the only logical way for us to operate on the assumption that it's going to stay federally legal. We're, we're not going to, we're not going to do stuff based upon the hope or the assumption that, you know, Congress is going to you know, pass law to legalize it. So I don't know when it's going to happen, but but it it does. While we are operating in a federally illegal um, industry, several there are several consequences. One of which we just talked about, which is the lack of PPP money for the industry uh, during the uh, shutdown for COVID. But there are other consequences um, that are that are important as well. Um, one is um, the federal tax laws are very different for this industry. So um, for those of you that study business, know that you know you Take your revenue, subtract your cost of goods sold, sub subtract your administrative costs, and what you're left over with is profit, and you get taxed on profit. In this industry, you can't deduct your administrative expenses. So you take your revenue, subtract your cost of goods sold, and you pay taxes on that. And that's a much, much higher amount of taxes than you would pay in any other industry when you can also deduct your administrative expenses. That will change if and only if the federal law changes, but it makes the, you know, it changes the economics and, and, and depresses the economics of this industry. Um, to me, the, the, the biggest consequence, however, of the federal legality and something I talked about a little bit earlier is there is no capital. There is no capital available in this industry. Um, that's, that's a bit of an overstatement, but none of the traditional sources of lending 
will participate in this industry. No banks. There, there, there are half a dozen banks in Massachusetts that will do cash management services for this industry, which is really important. It was not the case when we started. We had to beg them to get in. But all of those banks, and I, I'm deeply grateful for them providing cash management services, um, none of them will lend um, because they're all federally chartered and federally insured. And that will not change. There is a, there's an act in Congress that uh, uh, Senator Warren, among others, sponsored um, called the Safe Banking Act. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, that has passed the House but I don't even know if it's up for a debate or a vote in the Senate. So, um, so I, I'm not going to make any forecasts. I, mean, you know, I just don't see the, uh, the upside. But there is no question that the consequences of the federal, federal legality um, are real in terms of you know, people's incomes, the safety of, of the state, um, our equity and social justice objectives all are challenged by the federal legality. Um, but, you know, it is what it is and, and we're gonna do the best we can in that context. Um, how much, if at all, do you feel your role with commission overlaps with advocacy for the industry? Um, not at all. Um, I, I don't view myself as an advocate in the slightest. I view myself um, as a bureaucrat. <laughs> Never thought I'd say those words. Um, but um, my job is, is not to advocate. My job is to implement the law. Um, the only advocacy that I have done um, is to the legislature when I feel like they need to do something to help me do my job. So going to them and saying we need help um, clarifying who has governance over these host community agreements. I'm going to them and saying you need to do something so that we can do social consumption. Uh, that's some people would call that advocacy. I'm not sure. I, I I don't. I think that's just going to legislature and asking them to help me do my job. Um, I, I you know I talk to everybody. I made a decision my first day. Um, um, I'm going to talk to anybody who wants to talk to me. And Lori knows. I mean, she's seen me at all different kinds of events. I'm sorry, Professor Lucian. Um, but I speak to the industry, I speak to legislatures, I speak to lobbyists, I speak to applicants, I speak to industry associations. Um, I think that's an incredibly important part of my job, partly because my job is to represent the commission to those constituencies, but part of it is because that's the way I'm gonna do my job the best is by hearing from everybody and talking to everybody and listening and understanding their perspectives but I do not view um, my job in the slightest as advocacy. I'm sorry if I sound defensive on that, but that, I think that's a really important issue. <laughs> and I have spoken in some places where, um, you know, people have accused me of that, um, you know, whether it's, you know, um, uh, industry associations about um, equity or about social justice or, you know, on the flip side, um, going and talking to, you know, there, there are several uh, industry associations that I speak to uh, at their meetings. Um, I go to tell them what I believe. I go to listen to them. Um, I don't advocate for anybody, but I do. I do talk to anybody that wants to talk to me. Uh, from my experience as chairman, do you believe state legislatures view legalization as a tax revenue booster or a tool for social justice reform? Okay, I'm going to try to answer this without getting myself into really serious trouble. Um, it depends. Um, I believe that most of the social justice mandates that are in the legislation came from the Senate. Um, so what, what happened, you know, the, the voters passed uh, question four in November 2016. Um, it went into a legislature. They appointed a joint cannabis policy committee of three reps and three state senators. And that group uh, worked on the legislation. Um, I was not, you know, I, I was totally in the private sector at that point. I, I have no visibility or insight into that process or what happened. But, you know, in retrospect, what I what I have heard and learned is that most of the social justice um, um, mandates came from the Senate um, and fewer from the House. Um, don't know, don't know if that's true or not. Um, I will tell you that, you know, there's nobody in the House or the Senate is going to say they don't support the social justice mandates of the legislation, you know, that, that'd be political suicide to say. Um, so um, I, I'm not running to opposition. Um, I have a hard time getting the support I need. You know, one, one of the things I've been working on and I, I feel accountable for not having made more progress here, as I mentioned before, there's no money in this industry. There's no, you know, there's, there's no uh, capital available or very limited. Um, 
I mentioned Illinois. Uh, Illinois was the 12th state after us, um, so the, the next state after uh, us to um, legalize uh, recreational uh, use of marijuana. Um, and you know, to our credit, they copied a lot of our law, particularly the uh, social justice and the equity uh, aspects of our law. Um, I was, you know, very pleased and flattered by that. Um, even though I had nothing to do with writing the law, but I still think it was something that you know we as Massachusetts residents should be pleased by. Uh, but they did one thing that we didn't do in our law, and that is they created a fund. So we have a 20% tax um, on marijuana at retail. 3% is local for the city or town that's hosting the retail establishment. 6.25% is state sales tax, um, which goes into the general fund. And then uh, the other 10.75% is excise tax. And that excise tax, this is this is ironic. The excise tax has six or seven specific uses in the legislation, including uh, first responder training, um, 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 drug um, uh, education, and so forth. Uh, but the last line of that section of the legislation says, subject to legislative appropriation, which means they can do whatever they want with it. And if you uh, have been reading the Boston Globe, um, they've tried to investigate where this money has gone to. <laughs> that, that nobody can answer the question of where that money has gone to, um, what uses it's been put to. Um, I uh, um, have been working very hard and I got legislation filed um, by Sonia Chang Diaz, who is the uh, co-chair of the Marijuana Policy Committee in the Senate. Um, and uh, uh, she filed legislation uh, to divert some of that um, excise tax into a loan program um, for equity applicants. That too has gone out of, come out of committee. Um, that too, I can't, I can't uh, speak to where, uh, where it's going to go to. But uh, I, I will tell you that, you know, if I want to be, if, if people want to accuse me of being an advocate, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. That's, that's something I've been absolutely advocating. I've been, I've been, I've been beating my head against this wall for the better part of three years. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I think I think that the legislature certainly views this as a opportunity to create tax revenue for the state and the cities and towns. I think that a significant part of the legislature believes in the social justice um, objectives of this legislation. Um, it's not clear how many are willing to do what I think it takes um, to get to get to the results we need to. How was that? Did I get myself in trouble, uh, Professor Lucien? You are good. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'll tell you a funny story. So uh, when I first started this, um, I'd never been state government, never done anything like this. Um, and I went around and met. I met the governor. I met the attorney general. Um, I met the Speaker of the House. I met the President of the Senate. Um, and I uh, met with, with Speaker DeLeo, uh, one of my first meetings. And uh, he's an amazing man. Um, you know, he's very grandfatherly. And, you know, he sits in his, his chair. And, you know, he, he really is quite low-key. Um, he's an incredibly powerful guy, though. <laughs> but he doesn't show it. He's very, very low-key. Uh, but you meet with him. And, you know, you never get to meet with these guys by themselves. They always have three or four staff guys with them. And you know the meeting is over when the staff guys fold up their notebooks, straighten out their pants and start, you know, getting ready to stand up. You know the meeting is over. And so that happened. So I knew I had like one last chance. And I said, uh, I said, Mr. Speaker, you gotta call, you gotta call him Mr. Speaker. You can't call him sir, you can't call him Mr. DeLeo, you gotta call him Mr. Speaker. Um, and I said, sir, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this, this has been great. I've, I've learned so much, thank you so much. Um, but if you don't mind, I have one last question for you, which is, I've never been in the public eye before. I've never done media before. Do you have any advice for me? And he didn't pause for even a second. And he said, yeah, don't say anything stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have tried very hard, Professor Lucian, to live by that maxim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, I think you're successful. This was really great. Uh, let me do this one more question. So uh, let, me, uh, let me do that. And, uh, from an economic perspective, do you think the shadow unregulated economy will continue to have a downward price pressure or social policies and attempt to gain regulated economy participation? I, I'm not 100% sure that I, I follow. Let me, let me try to answer it, but then uh, you know, follow up if you want. Um, clearly, one of the objectives of the legislation is to um, minimize the black market, illicit market, gray market, whatever you want to call it. Um, I personally believe that it's never going to go away. Um, there's just, you know, the economics of being in the illicit market are quite different uh, than being a licensed 
marijuana enterprise. You know, you don't have to apply, you don't have to pay license fees, you don't have to pay taxes. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's ever going to go away. I, I do believe, however, that uh, most people would prefer to participate in the legal industry and most consumers would prefer to purchase in the legal industry. And, and, and not just because of, you know, personal um, um, preferences or social uh, mores, but everything that is sold in a retail store in the state of Massachusetts is labeled. It has been laboratory um, inspected. It is, you know, you know exactly what you're getting in terms of potency, in terms of additives, in terms of pesticides, or more importantly, lack thereof. Um, I, I'm hoping that even though there's always going to be a price differential, between the legal and the gray market. I'm hoping that, that two things happen. One is that over time that diminishes that we open more and more stores. Um, and two is that the price gap, you know, the price gap will diminish and, and people will feel more comfortable making that shift, but it'll never go away. Um, and it's very hard to quantify, but it absolutely is one of the, uh, one of the objectives of the legislation. So I don't know if, I hope I answered the question um, there's one more in regards to social equity program and giving certain groups advantages over others. Do you intend to have this exist in perpetuity or is it a finite policy? Good question. Um, I would say explicitly it's a finite policy. Um, it goes back to a comment I made earlier, which is when we did our first regulations in March of 2018. Um, I was proud of what we did, but I knew we'd have to continue to learn and adapt and adjust as we saw how the industry played out. So I, I, I think everything is on the table in a finite manner which is, you know, we're going to keep it there as long as it makes sense and we'll, we'll adjust. Um, uh, but there's, there's some parts of it that are very explicit. So um, for social equity um, applicants and economic empowerment applicants, um, we have said for delivery licenses and for social consumption licenses, only they can get those licenses for the next three years. Um, we retain the option of extending that um, exclusivity period longer. We think it's necessary, but for three years, they are the only people that can apply for those kinds of licenses. That explicitly, by definition, is finite. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, everything that we've done, including giving some priority and some um, expedition, uh, expedited treatment to certain uh, uh, categories of applicants, um, will keep in place as long as we think it's necessary but we'll continue, as I said, to adapt and adjust. And, you know, it might be a while when, you know, finite can be a long time because we are a long ways away from where we need to be and where we want to be and where we're committed to be in terms of our equity targets. Uh, if you look at the diversity industry um, in terms of ownership, if you look at the diversity of the industry in terms of employment, um, we're, we're not where we want to be. We want the diversity of this industry to look like the state of Massachusetts in terms of ethnicity, gender. Uh, we want the participation of veterans and of LGBT and of disabled people. And we're just not there. Um, so we'll continue doing this and, and keeping these kinds of preferences in place as long as we need to. And and not and not rest on the fact that we'll ultimately the, what we've got in place is going to work. We'll continue to try to innovate and learn and try new things. Uh, but we are not where we need to be or want to be, or as I said, am, are committed to be on this. I had a question. Why would- uh, Are why, you allowed? <laughs> am I allowed? Pick me. Um, why are micro businesses not included in this round in priority when they were in the last round? Well, they, they still have priority. So, so you know- For, uh, for delivery? Um, well, two things. One is micro businesses can get delivery endorsements. Yep. Oh, they can still they still can do that. Yeah, they still can do that, and they're still they're still prioritized in terms of our um, application review process. Okay. So uh, yeah, we have I you know I, we might need to do more to because there's, there's only a few of them out there, but uh, um, we have we haven't changed or reduced any of their uh, priorities or preferences. Okay, so that will be maintained. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And for for the craft marijuana cooperative, they'll still be able to get social consumption. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Social, but social consumption is unfortunately right, right now at our hands, and I just I don't know exactly how long it's going to take. Unfortunately, um, you know, I think it's it's fairly obvious the legislature is preoccupied right now, um, as you know, as they should be. Uh, we still don't have a budget. The state does not have a budget because mm -hmm. um, you know we're in unprecedented times, and so you know I. Uh, 
I, I try, you know, I think you gotta be careful with the legislature. You know, you can't tell them what to do. Um, you can't tell them what their priorities should be. That's not my role in any case. Um, so I advocate, but I certainly have to be respectful that, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on right now that that's really important. Um, and, you know, I, I, it's their, it's their decision about how to prioritize stuff. So the, the, the legislation on host community agreements is incredibly important. The legislation on the loan fund um, is very important. The legislation on social consumption is very important, but there are a lot of, you know, a lot of things competing for the title right. of support right now. And so I, uh, I, I don't know how long it's going to take. I, I, you know, I don't even know how long it's going to take, quite honestly, for the state to get a budget. I mean, we uh, in the two previous fiscal years prior to COVID, we were the 49th in uh, state one year and the 50th state the second year to get a budget. So we, we've always been a little slow about this in Massachusetts, <laughs> but uh, now we're uh, we're absolutely in unprecedented circumstances. I think it's because of the number of Haitians that are here. We're never on time. You think that's it? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, does anybody uh, have any more questions? Or do you have any questions for, for the students? You can, you oh, can... I, I, no, I, no, I don't. I mean, I, you know, we're hiring. <laughs> so I hope you guys, uh, I hope you guys, uh, I think that this is, this is a pretty interesting industry. Um, and, you know, it's, as I said, Early on, um, we, we got a long ways to go. Um, I, I think there's just an enormous opportunity, not not just on the regulatory side, but you know, on the uh, on the industry side. This is a pretty this is a pretty interesting place to spend time right now. And and you know, if you want to get into politics, um, there's a lot of open legislative issues that I've articulated. Uh, so I I think you know this is a pretty exciting place to be, and uh, I think it's going to be that way for a while. Um, so I hope some of you guys consider coming to work for us or other people in the industry, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think this is, I think this is, uh, both exciting and important. I, I really do. You know, the reason I took this, you know, I, I made fun of my wife, which I, you know, I do all the time. Um, but, um, you know, she got me to, to really open my eyes and, and realize this is important and I can have an impact. Um, and you know, that, you know, I'm a little older than you guys, but that that's pretty important to me. Um, and, uh, I, I just want to suggest to you that you guys, can have an impact as well because this industry is still evolving and changing and there's a lot that can be done to make it work for everybody and so uh, if you want to have an impact um, this is a pretty this is a pretty interesting place and, and it's and it's fun I mean it's it's a little bit like the wild west I mean you know there aren't a lot of rules you know we're, we're trying to figure it out as we go along so uh, I think this is a pretty cool place to uh, to spend some time professionally if you're if so interested so I hope some of you at least consider that What's the best method for them to apply if anybody is looking to take for a little a, a gig with the CCC? Yeah, uh, well, I, I'll tell you, this is me. I'm speaking for myself. I'm not necessarily speaking for the commission that way. So we uh, we interviewed. The first thing we did after we uh, got appointed is uh, we we uh, started looking for an executive director. So you think about the commission as kind of the board of directors of the company, the executive director is the CEO. We we can we can pontificate all we want at the commission, but to actually do stuff, we need an executive director who can hire people and pay people and so forth. Um, so we we started a search for executive director, and uh, uh, we had three final candidates. And, and back to the open meeting law, uh, it turned out we had to do the interviews of those candidates in public. Wow! Can you imagine going for a job interview and being interviewed in public by five five people on TV? Um, but what's even worse than that is after we did the interviews with the three final candidates, we then had to discuss in public which ones we liked better than the others and why. <laughs> and I, it was just horrifying. But uh, one of the things I said about Sean Collins, who, uh, by the way, is a Suffolk uh, grad, a Suffolk law grad, um, uh, defending why I thought he was the right choice, as I said, he was humble. And what I meant by that is he recognized how hard this was. He recognized that we don't have all the answers. He recognized that we can't forecast with, 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 with a high degree of, of certainty how this industry is gonna evolve. And so I guess that was a long-winded way to answer your question, Professor Lucien, which is go on with a little humility uh, because you know, this is hard. This is, you know, I've done some pretty cool stuff professionally in my life. This is far and away the hardest thing I've ever done far and away, um, partly because of the public scrutiny, but partly because 
it is so hard to kind of figure out how this industry is going to evolve and, and you know, what turns it's going to take. Uh, it's just, it's really, really hard. And so you got to go into it, I think, with an understanding. You're not going to figure it out. Um, you're not going to have all the answers. You're going to have to sometimes trust your gut, um, make the best judgment you can make, knowing that, you know, it might or might not be right. Um, I think it takes that kind of um, understanding and humility. Um, to be successful in this business. So I guess if I have one word of advice, it's be, be humble. Two words of advice, be humble. That's powerful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. I hope that uh, this was valuable to, uh, to you and your students. Um, and I'll try not to schedule next year's meeting to conflict with your class. I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd, love, to. I'd love to come back and do it again. <laughs> no, thank you so much. This was, this was really great. Yeah. Um, hopefully I would, it would be amazing if one of you guys ended up at the CCC. Well, we do have a couple of commission openings. That you, know. true. you guys should go, <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Um, yeah. but yeah, thank you so much. No, my, my, my pleasure, Professor Lucien. And, uh, thanks to everybody for, uh, for your questions and for, uh, and for, uh, your attentive stares. I, I, I hope this was, uh, useful to you for doing, doing something like this, you know, in this, in this context, it's so hard. It's so much easier doing it in person. You can right. see how the audience is reacting and whether, you know, people are, you know, tracking with you. And so I hope this was valuable and useful to you guys, but thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, be safe, please. Thank you. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, let's get going. Marijuana social consumption establishments. This is where we left off last week. Okay, what are the, we didn't talk about this, right? Limitation on sales. You can only sell amounts of marijuana, mar marijuana products in amounts that are reasonable for on-site consumption. You can't sell more than 20 milligrams of THC to a, to a consumer. And you can only sell prepackaged self stable shelf stable items. You can't sell perishable items. Now, if you're so you can sell food and drinks that are not marijuana infused, but you have to get all necessary permits. And this is the kicker: no tobacco, no alcohol. You can only have THC. So I'm like, oh, this is whack. But whatever. Y'all could just, you know, sneak your nips in like you. <laughs> Um, age verification. No admittance to, to those younger than 21, obviously. They're going to check your IDs. Um, and all of it, um, any in, individuals will not be admitted without having that verification checked and, sh and, and showing proof of the identica identification. Remember that Buzz Killington card that I told you guys about? I might have warned you about it. Um, the Buzz Killington card is this. Anytime you show up to a... To a um, a social consumption establishment, whenever they get licensed, you, when you order your product, they're going to hand you a card. And this card is going to have information about marijuana consumption. And it's going to talk about the um, effects of marijuana. It's going to tell you about the length of time it takes to take effect into your body. Um, and the information has to be scientifically based and it's going to be two-sided. And you have to orally affirm that you understand what you're about to, to, to consume. And I call it again, Buzz Killington card. <clears throat> I should have just said that in front of the commissioner. He'd have been like, Lori, <laughs> you calling my regs? You make fun of my regs? Yes, sir. Okay, general operational requirements. Again, you can't sell tobacco or alcohol. Everything has to be tracked via the seat to sale tracking. Um, the, the hours of delivery, you cannot deliver um, between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. Um, and you have to minimize cash on premises, but that's good for all these marijuana businesses. Now, um, consumption areas. For where needed for security purposes, the consumption area has to be separate from the sales area. Um, it, it has to be an isolated, it has to be isolated from the other areas of, of the establishment. And by it, I mean the consumption area. Um, it can be separated by walls and a secure do uh, door. Um, the consumption area has to be visible from the sales area though. So the way I'm assuming is like, they're probably gonna have this door with like glass and you could just see through it. Vaporizers. Now we talked about it a little bit um, with the commissioner, but um, you, you're allowed to vaporize it on the property and do other non-smoking forms of consumption that involves heat, but you have to have a ventilation system that's able to 
handle the, that kind of activity. In addition, if you are allowing vaporization, you have to have a smoke-free area for agents in order for them to monitor the consumption area. Waste disposal. Now, this is what breaks my heart, you guys. You can't, you can't carry out your weed. You have to throw out the marijuana before you leave because it's not a, it's not a um, dispensary. It's a, it's a social consumption site. Um, let's see. Incident reporting. Again, as a, as a social consumption establishment, embedded in your obligation is the right, is the, is the obligation to snitch on people who do the following activities. So you're required to report to law enforcement in the CCC within no more than 24 hours. If you find somebody consuming tobacco on your property, that includes your employees as well. Um, also, if somebody brings their own cannabis to your property, you're supposed to report them. Also, if somebody's consuming proper, uh, cannabis in an area that is not um, a designated area for that, you'll also have to let call the popo and let the CCC know. This section makes me very uncomfortable. You know, especially we live in places where we have, you know, mandatory minimums for certain things. I just don't like getting the feds involved. Why don't I just deal with the person and say, dude, you know you can't be smoking here. Get off the property. Why do I have to let the cops know? But the cops will know because we have to record everything. So I'm like iffy about ever opening a social consumption site um, in the white market, <laughs> in the legal market. Okay, prohibitions. Um, what can't you do? You cannot sell unauthorized marijuana. So that involves also like selling perishable items, things that haven't been tested, no smoking indoors ever, no consumption while working, that is for the employees. Again, no tobacco and alcohol, no BYOC. You cannot discount the marijuana products. And while I'm talking about discounts, in the new regulations, the only time an adult use marijuana establishment by when what by what when what I mean by new regulations, I mean the uh, the round of updates that have been made to the regulations recently, the one that the commissioner was talking about, um, you're allowed to give employee discounts now in order to prevent diversion. So they're hoping that if you can get an employee discount, it will disincentivize employees from stealing from these dispensaries. And now we go to the outdoor smoking waiver. Now the indoor smoking waiver can, uh, the indoor smoking prohibition can never be waived. However, the outdoor smoking um, prohibition can be waived if you request a waiver. Um, and this can be done by getting your board of health or your health commissioner for that municipality to submit um, to the CCC is gonna, is gonna submit a request to the board of health or the health commissioner of that municipality and ask them to, to, to confirm that it's okay and um, that you comply with the local rules that you know the surrounding community is gonna be, it's not gonna be impacted negatively, that you're not gonna be a detrimental impact to that area. And you'll be in, and hopefully you can get that waiver. But the, the municipality has to agree. All right, let's see. We got some time. So marijuana delivery only retailers. So what are the general requirements? So again, t t this could change tomorrow, you guys. <laughs> At this point, like, why are you teaching me this? Because I need to teach you something for the exam, okay? We're not gonna wait till tomorrow and then I gotta make new slides, get out of here. Just kidding. Um, we'll, 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 we've already talked about the, the potential updates, but just, just so we can get things going, what we'll, we'll, this is the information that we're gonna focus on for the final, okay? Not what goes down tomorrow. Is that all right? Bueno, all right. Delivery only retailer license allows you to deliver marijuana directly to consumers. Um, the only individual allowed to do this, you have to be an employee of the delivery only retailer and you have to be registered as a marijuana establishment agent. Um, all marijuana and marijuana products delivered by the retailer has to be obtained from a licensed marijuana retailer with which this delivery only retailer has a delivery agreement. Y'all remember this? I think I talked about this, I keep sprinkling this in. So basically the, and the only way you could deliver within the model as it is now is to be like a Grubhub where you, the, the, the delivery company 
goes to a marijuana dispensary with which you with whom you have a delivery agreement and then you pick up product and you deliver it directly to the consumer so i don't understand why the retailers don't like this because they're getting the business the retailer, the retailer is like this what they've changed the the new regulations allow the retailers to wholesale and have their to have their own warehouse sorry not wholesale to have their own warehouse and deliver directly from the warehouses in package. So now they've eliminated the delivery, uh, the marijuana dispensaries. Now they're upset because they spent a lot of money getting these marijuana dispensary locations. And they already know with COVID and especially with uh, brick and mortar businesses dying in general, they won't be able to compete with these delivery retailers. Does that make sense? Now, a lot of companies are gonna be using these things, these, these companies called third-party platform providers. What they are is they're the software company that a lot of companies are going to be using in order to um, process all these orders. Um, you're allowed to facilitate ordering through these TPTPPs. <laughs> it's like, I'm trying to come up with a better one, TPP. Let's, let's go with that. All agreements between these delivery only retailers and third party technology platforms have to be made available to the CCC for inspection because you could see a company like Amazon providing the, um, the software with a bunch of other attachments to it and really becoming a um, uh, having a monopoly over the technology and kind of like what the chairman was talking about. He's trying to prevent these types of monopolies from developing in the industry. So um, if there are any changes to these platform provider uh, agreements, you have to notify the CCC within uh, uh, five days. Uh, the, 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 these, these platforms have to comply with privacy and consumer protection standards. Um, and you have to let the CCC know if you have any additional agreements. All right, general delivery requirements. You are not allowed to have more than $10,000 of inventory in your um, vehicle at, at one time again like i mentioned you have to track and you have to track all the marijuana and marijuana products through the seed to sales system there are geographic limitations to delivery so a delivery only retailer can only is geographically geographically limited to the municipality identified on that marijuana establishment license in addition they're allowed to deliver in any municipality that allows marijuana retailers, even if they don't, they don't have an operational marijuana retailer there. So for example, say there's a town that has a, a, an ordinance allowing marijuana retail to take place in that municipality. However, they have not licensed any businesses there yet. Because they have a means for allowing marijuana retailers, you're allowed to deliver in those municipalities. Does that make sense? Good. All right. <clears throat> so when it comes to municipal compliance, all deliveries have to be completed before 9 p.m. It has to be reiter reiterated. So um, make sure that if you're getting your pregame, you pregame, you plan early, okay? 9 p.m., you're done. <laughs> but you can still walk into my store. It'll be open till 10. This is not an advertisement, Suffolk. Relax. <laughs> um, minimize cash. You have to minimize the cash um, on your, in your vehicle, and I would do so, period, and, like, make it known that you don't carry cash on you. Um, orders. Let's see what time it is. Okay, we're going to keep pushing. We're gonna get through delivery at least tonight. Okay, so all marijuana and marijuana products have to be obtained from licensed marijuana retailers, right? We talked about this, with whom they have delivery agreements. Now, orders from home deliveries have to be received by the marijuana retailer and transmitted to the delivery only retailer for delivery to a residence, got it? So it's the marijuana retailer that receives the order and it transfers it to the delivery only retailer. The the marijuana retailer can also have the third party transporter receive these orders. Does that make sense? Because it's the software, they can also do that. So all marijuana products that to be delivered have to be shelf stable, like I mentioned, if it's perishable, you're not allowed to deliver it. Um, you can only deliver to the residence address provided. You can't deliver to a college or university dormitories. 
You can't deliver to federally and state subsidized housing. You can't deliver to shelters, nor can you deliver to residential programs, okay? Again, <clears throat> in order to determine what is federally and state subsidized, there's this, I think within this, the, the CCC itself has a document that has a link to HUD and HUD will populate all of these documents, all of the locations that are federally funded. So your third party provider will, will have all of this in the software plan for you. And if they don't, make sure you ask them, does this software automatically detect which houses are off limits based on where the funding is based off of? Okay. All right, <clears throat> where are we? So uh, the, the delivery only retailers can only, can only deliver marijuana products for which a specific order has been received by the marijuana retailer. Um, delivery only retailers are prohibited from delivering marijuana without a specific order destined for an identified residence. An order may be, gen again, generated directly through a retailer or through a third party technology platform. You cannot, so let's talk about the orders. You cannot deliver more marijuana product to an individual than the individual possession amount required by the law. So you can so you can deliver more than an ounce. So there's a one ounce limit um, of marijuana or its, or its dry rate weight equivalent. Deliveries are restricted to consumer to the consumer identified on the order. Right? You can only have one order per consumer per day. I mean per per uh, per delivery. And you can only have <laughs> one, and you can only deliver to the same consumer at the same residence once. So let's let's wrap that up. What does that mean? Get one order per day per consumer, right? At your residence. People try to switch things up and try to go to different places. You could try it, but it has to be the same person, same location. Um, if it's the same person, same location, um, you can't deliver twice. Make sure you have more than one adult at the house, okay? Then you can get multiple orders per day. So there's, there's loopholes to everything. <laughs> okay, what happens to undeliverable or refused marijuana products? Because these deliver companies don't have their own warehouses, they're not allowed to keep um, to keep uh, possession of these products. They have to deliver them, return them to the marijuana establishment if they've been undelivered or refused. Um, they, they do that, they can do it at the end of their shift, at, at the end of the deliveries, they can't maintain custody. Um, the burden of returning undelivered products is on the retailer, on the delivery only retailer. They have to make sure that they get back to the marijuana, marijuana establishment in time for closing. <clears throat> These delivery only retailers have to ensure that they verify the age of the, con of, of the consumer Remember, there's a pre-verification pro uh, process where the person has to go to the marijuana establish establishment either physically or through some electronic means and verify the the and, and verify and provide the ID that they intend to use for verification. Once that's been done, then they're in the system. Then they can put in their orders for delivery. All right. Let's see. Okay. Talked about this. So what are the requirements for the vehicles that are gonna be used for delivery? This is another reason why these marijuana establishments, the brick and mortars are upset because how expensive is it to get a car outfitted? You can buy a used Prius, easily get two safes to put in the back, get a GPS. I mean, it could cost you like as little as $45,000 if you know somebody who can do the work, the manual labor for you. So you're looking at $45,000 and maybe you're, you're getting a really small 500 square foot warehouse that you're, you're renting at 3000 a month. You're literally not spending as much as they have for their $10,000 a month retail locations. All right, <clears throat> moving forward. Vehicles used for home delivery has to be, they have to be owned or leased by the delivery only retailer and properly registered as commercial vehicles and they have to be inspected and insured um, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. These vehicles can be parked overnight at the address identified as the licensee's place of business 
or another location, provided that keeping the lo- the vehicle at that identified at that identified location complies with all general uh, and special bylaws of the municipality. So, if municipalities have no issues with you parking your car on the street, you, you you're fine. Um, these cars have to carry uh, liability insurance of not less than a million dollars for combined single single limit. Um, they can't have any external markings, words, or symbols that indicate that it's a vehicle that's being used to deliver cannabis um, in, in marijuana products. And all these vehicles, they have to be staffed by a minimum of two agents at a time, one of whom has to stay in the car during deliveries when marijuana is in the vehicle. So um, the marijuana and marijuana products cannot be visible from the outside of the, ve- of the vehicle, but they're going to be in a safe anyway, so you're good. They must be transported in a secure lock storage compartment. There has to be two separate lock storage compartments, one for cash, one for p- marijuana and marijuana products. And while you're in transit, um, moving about, you have to maintain contact with the marijuana dis- the retailer or the third party transporter. In fact, you have to be in contact before you leave the facility, after you leave the facility, and regularly within throughout the trip, at least every 30 minutes. If you do have to make an emergency stop, you have to log the reason you made the stop, um, the duration, the location, and any activities of personnel exiting the vehicle. Um, that's it. So we can talk a little bit about logs now. Each delivery retailer has to maintain a separate log for each vehicle in use for home deliveries, okay? Um, For each delivery, the delivery only company is gonna create a log that includes the location of of the originating marijuana retailer, including the date and time that the vehicle left the location. You're gonna put the mileage of the transporting vehicle at departure from the marijuana retailer, mileage on arrival at each consumer destination and mileage on returning to the marijuana establishment. You're also gonna provide the date and time of departure from the marijuana establishment and arrival at each consumer destination from delivery. You are documenting every aspect of this, of the, of this delivery, right? Like that's, the, that's, that's, the, that's fundamentally, if you, remember, if you wanna be a compliance officer, if they ask you, what should I document? You gotta say everything. When they when they and they're gonna ask you when you're gonna say all the time. That's gonna be your response for everything. <laughs> okay, everything all the time. Okay, and, and you're gonna also document an entry indicating the date and time of the last delivery in in an order. Now all the routes have to remain within Massachusetts. I actually went ran into an issue where I was going to buy a property in Attleboro for cultivation and retail, and literally like. Half the property was in Rhode Rhode Island. Another half of it was in Massachusetts. I just felt like I didn't trust my employees enough to not like (laughs) run across the other side of the building with a pack of weed on them. And then I get shut down. So I stopped pursuing that business. But it is a real consideration when it comes to delivery routes. For example, this building, in order for you to enter into the front of the facility, you literally had to go through Rhode Island. There was no route in Massachusetts to get into the front of the building. All right, that's that's enough on that. Let, uh, next, you have to make every effort to randomize your delivery routes because they think that there are people, which probably exist, who are going to be observing your business, trying to identify how you move so that they can um, do not nice things and rob you. So you have to ensure that you're safe and you randomize your routes to the best of your abilities. They have computer software that, that, that can do that for you. Um, <clears throat> You're also not allowed to transport any other marijuana products during time, any other marijuana and marijuana products during those times of performing home deliveries. Let me repeat that one more time. You can't deliver products other than marijuana and marijuana products. The reason that's important, I had this company approached me about two years ago that wanted to combine delivery of marijuana with like chips and stuff. So he had like contracts with like Lay's potato chips and Coca-Cola, all these things. And he had these cool little munchies packages and you could order weed and get your package at the same time. Well, this basically says you can't get your munchies and the weed at the same time. You're going to have to get up and go to 7-Eleven or wherever you go. (laughs) 
All right. Some of y'all want to do Trader Joe's. You bougie. That's cool. Some of us still do 7-Eleven because we keep it to the culture. <laughs> or the bodega if you're from New York. All right. Keep moving forward. Um, firearms are strictly prohibited from delivery vehicles and from marijuana establishment agents. I didn't grow up in America. I know that you Americans are weird about guns. But where I came, grew up, like guns were not a big thing. It wasn't like a political thing. It was about survival. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it was not a safe country. And so this is not a safe, the safest uh, um, occupation. We all know this. It's weed. Go to, go to Netflix, watch Murder Mountain. Things are like, it's not the safest. So for me, the fact that we can't have firearms on our persons, I feel like that's not the best. But there are ways if you want to spend extra money or you really feel unsafe, you can have another vehicle that isn't your business that is following that car that does have a, a, a weapon in it, but that's just a, a somebody that you hire as a contractor. I think what might happen, the worst case scenario, and I hope you don't mind, I may do a, a separate class towards the end where I talk about things like securities and exchange, and you can watch that on your own time. And then when we go through the final, I'll go through it in, in, in depth that way. You tell me what you want, it's your world, okay? But I'm going to let you go right here because I, I, you know, we had a great class, a lot of energy. You probably want to go talk and chat about Chairman Hoffman. <laughs> um, so um, if you, do you guys have any questions? Okay. Remind me, Lori, you stopped that manifest. All right, you guys have a great weekend. Enjoy your life. Um, you know, do not let, do not be boggled down by too much stress. If you are feeling stressed out, that means that you not, you need to ignore the voices in your head that are telling you to keep going, take a fucking break. Okay. Chill. Like even for two hours, set a timer, take a break. And then don't think about anything. Go out, walk with your dog and then come back to it. Cause I'll promise you one thing. I've been on this planet for 33 years. It's not long, but for my 33 years, stress never goes away forever. Okay, it's always gonna come back. That's the only guarantee. It always comes back. So take your break. Don't worry, it'll be back for you. Okay. All right. Take enjoy the rest of this week. When you come back, I want to hear what you did to make sure that you reduce your stress. And don't let the crazies get to you. All right. Have a great night. <laughs>